Yeah, we're ready. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Grimm from the Wisconsin Historical Society, and I really want to welcome you all to Module 1 of today's Practical Digital Preservation Workshop. This workshop is part of a larger training program that will be held between now and June of 2016 and is a partnership between the Council of State Archives and Preservica. Over the course of the next several months, we'll be holding a total of three preservation workshops to provide a practical understanding of key concepts and processes involved with the long-term preservation of digital collections. And then this will be supplemented by additional hot topic webinars that will cover topics that are really at the forefront of challenges currently facing our community. And those are all highlighted here, and there's a link out to more detailed descriptions of those if you're interested in uh, taking a look and seeing if they're interesting to you. On today's program, we're going to be split into two different parts, and questions can be asked throughout with the chat feature along the side of the WebEx window. You can enter your questions at any time, although they may not be answered immediately. We promise we will get to them before the end of the day. And at the end of the preservation uh, presentation, there will be a survey that will launch you that will launch when you close the webinar window where we would really appreciate if you could provide us some feedback on the training you're receiving today. And as a special bonus, there will be a place to enter your email address if you're interested in receiving a copy of the slides you'll be seeing here today. Now I'd like to take a moment and introduce Michael Hope and Jack O'Sullivan from Preservica who will be leading our training today. Michael has over 25 years experience helping organizations around the world maximize the benefits of their IT and information management systems. His recent focus as marketing director for Preservica has been to raise the awareness of importance of digital preservation, including devising and running education in partnership with leading industry bodies such as the Archives and Records Association, ARA, the Information and Records Management Society, the IRMS in the UK, and the American Records Managers Association, ARMA. And of course, they're working with the COSA as well. Jack O'Sullivan is a lead technical consultant, and while he now resides in Boston, has been with Preservica since 2011. He has worked as a developer on a number of digital preservation projects for many of Preservica's major customers, including the UK Parliamentary Archives, the HSBC Corporate Archives, and the National Library of Australia. He has been responsible for leading development on a number of Preservica workflows and features, including the migration of content within container formats, integration with Amazon's Glacier Storage, and the integration with Archive Space. He has also worked closely with FamilySearch on a number of projects, including providing support to maintain their 50 terabyte daily ingest rate. So with that, gentlemen, I am going to turn this over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, it's a real delight to uh, to speak with everybody today, and uh, thank you, thank you for calling in. Uh, it's incredible to see the the number of participants and the the interest uh, in this subject. <clears throat> so, just to um, give you a little bit of background, uh, this is a uh, a course that we've uh, worked worked on with with the COSA team and with Sarah uh, in particular, and uh, it's it's based on a highly rated program that we ran uh, with, as Sarah was saying, with the Archives and Records Association uh, in in the UK, and it went down very well there. So hopefully it will uh, it'll be great for you guys as well. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at uh, it's actually coming in two parts. Uh, when we ran this previously, it was just over one day, but we're doing this uh, sort of online in, in two parts. So we're looking at module one today, uh, and the objectives there are really to uh, <clears throat> help you understand the fundamentals of digital preservation and get get all of the acronyms and the theory out of the way. You know, some of you will know some of that already, but uh, hopefully we can we can build on your knowledge. And the key to these. Um, workshops is that it's all about practical digital preservation. Uh, so we'll be underscoring the theory and the acronyms with you know, practical examples of a real-world digital preservation workflows. So that's the objective for today. Uh, and then next Tuesday, in a week's time, we have module two, which will go in more detail uh, into how digital preservation fits into the overall information governance life cycle. Uh, in particular, we'll we begin to look at more complex uh, file formats such as uh, long-term records, emails, uh, websites, uh, and also explore <coughs> how, 
uh, some of the challenges of how you open up your archive and, and provide access to the information in there. So module one today and then module two uh, next week. So just before I hand over to, to Jack, uh, I thought I'd give a, a very, very quick overview of, uh, of Preservica. So we've been in working in digital preservation uh, for over 15 years. Uh, we started out uh, working with the UK National Archives. It started as a, as a research project uh, after they realized that um, you know, file format preservation and migration in particular was, was a key challenge. So we, we worked with them and developed the Droid tool, uh, which, which Jack will talk more about, um, as well as um, worked on them on the, on the Pronom uh, registry, which uh, Jack will also talk a little bit more about. Uh, so we've sort of rapidly grown since then. Um, we've launched a cloud edition. We have an on-premise uh, edition uh, and probably got now about 70, 70 plus uh, customers uh, using Preservica right the way uh, around the world. So that, that includes um, 12 state archives who are, I'm delighted to say are using, have chosen Preservica, um, as well as a whole, a whole bunch of other customers. Um, so we have national and pan-national archives, uh, libraries, museums, and education. And we also have uh, business and corporate archives using using Preservica. So it makes for a very vibrant uh, user community and we get together on a, on a regular basis, face to face. I think the last time uh, State Archives were together as a, as a user community was in Austin uh, and we also had a user meeting in Cleveland at SAA um, and we usually have an online meeting uh, once a quarter uh, as new releases of, of the software come out. And we also have work, uh, working groups where groups of customers with a particular interest in a particular function or feature will get together and help um, develop that feature and function for, you know, for the rest of the community. So it's a very vibrant community. I'm delighted to say that uh, um, Associated Press, uh, one of the latest um, to, to join us, um, and they've got an incredible history of the news um, going back through some you know, momentous events. And uh, also, I can't seem to keep up with all the logos on here, but we've also, uh, Yale University Library has also uh, recently joined us. So it's, it's an exciting time to be in, in digital preservation and working with digital preservation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to, uh, to Jack, who will take you through uh, the, the workshop today. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm Jack O'Sullivan. I'm technical consultant here at Preservica. So the, the purpose of the webinar today really is to address some of the fundamentals of digital preservation. So some of this might be familiar ground to some of you, but hopefully um, there will be some insight into how this works in practice that will be useful to, to everyone. So what we're going to look at today, the agenda for this module is why we need digital preservation. You know, we'll see what's the right, the root driving cause of this. And we'll have a look later on in the session about understanding some of the, the basic concepts that underline digital preservation, such as metadata, um, what we mean by file fixity and characterization. And then next week's module, um, we'll be looking at a bit more on the sort of preservation planning and action side, how we can actually start working with records, preparing to preserve them for the long term. And then how we can provide access to this digital content, um, obviously one of the key reasons for keeping and preserving your uh, digital content is so that people can actually use it at some point in the future. So we'll, we'll talk about that and have a look at some sort of more complex examples of digital records such as um, emails and, uh, and website harvesting. So 
we'll be doing some live practical examples today. Um, obviously, I'm going to be using Preservica as a preservation system. Um, there are other preservation systems available. Um, so this is a few of the um, alternatives that, that do um, similar things uh, to, a, to a greater or lesser extent. So we're going to start by sort of addressing the question of why we need digital preservation at all. So ex exploring the sort of problem that, we, that we're all going to be facing. So digital preservation is a long-term process. It's the process of ensuring that information that continues to have value is available um, and usable um, over the long term. And it involves planning, resource allocation, application of preservation methods. Um, and it's really addressing the challenges of keeping digital content available for the long term. And one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we'll be talking about is the idea of obsolescence. Um, so obsolescence of technology, obsolescence of file formats. And really what we're talking about is obsolescence occurring when a digital object that we have, a digital record, becomes unusable in some way due to new developments in either the software or the hardware that sort of underlines um, the digital information landscape. And this is something that nearly all of us will have encountered at some point in our lives, either through you know, things like floppy disk drives becoming increasingly difficult to find, or even just programs that we're used to using, like Microsoft Word, changing their file formats from version to version. So there are a number of institutional risks that we face running if we don't have any kind of long-term preservation strategy, or if we have a poor preservation strategy. And really, the main one is that you'll be unable to provide access to your digital assets at the point that that's needed. Or maybe you'll be able to provide access, but you won't be able to provide it in a, a usable form. And depending on your particular circumstances, you, may, you might be under a legal obligation to, to hold this material and to make it available. You might have a legislative mandate to, to do this. And you might have actual legal and financial liability if you're unable to provide access or if people are unable to use the content that you provide access to. But as well as facing sort of legal and regula regulatory um, sanctions, there's also the cost of the damage to the reputation of your institution. So if you are a long-term archive, not being able to provide archival material is going to be something that has an impact on the way that your institution is viewed. And obviously, a lot of material is that we're thinking about at the moment is sort of digitized versions of um, existing analog records. And quite often, the process of digitizing those materials is complex and expensive, and losing all of that work is something that will potentially have a financial cost when you try and um, have to replicate that. And ultimately, the main risk, the main consequence is that we will lose that knowledge. Um, any information that's only ever been held in digital form is vulnerable to being lost forever if we can't take care of it. That said, without wanting to put anyone into a, a doom and gloom cycle, there are benefits of having a, a good preservation strategy. Um, so being able to make your information more accessible, being able to increase the transparency of your organization. Being able to reuse some of that information in future. So you've spent a lot of money acquiring this information. you spend a lot of resources, a lot of time acquiring it. It's good to be able to make use of that again in the future. Good digital preservation can save you a lot of time in finding information. So when somebody comes to you with a request, you're able to fulfill that in a more timely manner. You have, have to 
devote fewer resources to fulfilling that request. And that might be um, researchers, users of the archives, but it might also be being able to respond quickly to um, legal and compliance challenge, challenges. You might be able to retire some existing legacy systems that are only being um, maintained for the information that's being held within them. And that can have um, a great deal of cost savings uh, to your organization in the future. And importantly, it supports new digital ways of working. So we're all transitioning to um, increasingly digital environments, uh, the paperless office. Um, a good preservation strategy will support that sort of transition. So what's really important when we think about digital records? So clearly being able to prove the authenticity of digital records, so being able to demonstrate to somebody that this is the same record that was entrusted to you at some point in the past, um, and being able to produce the provenance of those records. So having a record of any change that has been made to those um, and the reasons that those changes were made. And we'll look at um, sort of those aspects uh, in today's session. What's also going to be potentially important um, is obviously the, the long-term preservation, but potentially things like retention and disposition. So if you have long-term records that you need to keep for a period of time, but which aren't being held forever, and you need to be able to make sure that you um, dispose of those records at the time that they should be disposed of and that you are, have completely um, deleted all trace of those records. And obviously, access to your records is also going to be important, but ensuring that access is only granted appropriately, so making sure that you have the correct security um, provisions in place and that you've considered the sort of privacy aspects of the information that you're holding. And as I say, we'll sort of cover more of the authenticity and provenance in today's session um, and preservation retention is going to be in, in next week's session. So digital content is fragile um, in a very similar sense to the idea of analog records being fragile. So if you have paper records, you we're used to the idea that you should be storing these carefully in humidity controlled environments and that you should be trying to keep any acids away from them, things like that. Um, digital content is fragile in a slightly different way. We're not in danger of breaking um, an office document apart by double clicking on it too hard or turning the page on our book viewer too quickly. But it's fragile in that it exists in an entire chain of um, dependencies. So if you think of something like a Microsoft Word document, the information is encoded in that particular file format. And to be able to open that file format, we have to have something like Microsoft Word. We have to have a piece of software that supports um, decoding that information and displaying it to us. But in order to run that software, we need to have um, an operating system, so Windows or Mac OS, something that's capable of ensuring that software can actually run. And in order to run that operating system, we need some hardware, so your laptop computer, your phone, your desktop. Um, and we need somewhere to store all of that information. So again, things like hard drives, um, uh, tape, tape drives. And each part of the stack is um, subject to potential obsolescence. And it's subject to obsolescence within the sort of lifetime of that information. So if you think about how often um, operating systems change, that's maybe every three or four years, um, how often do you replace your phone, your, your laptop computers, the hardware underlying everything? Is again, you're thinking of like three to five year technology cycles. And even with more durable um, technologies like tape, we're thinking in the sort of 10 to 15 year life cycle. 
And those time frames are short compared to, well, certainly compared to permanent retention, but also compared to sort of long-term retention where we're thinking of maybe 50, 70, 100 years. And digital preservation is about ensuring that that information is maintained through these obsolescence events. So making sure that we have strategies in place to, to mitigate the, the fact that our file formats might change, our software might change, our, our hardware might change. But there are also other potential preservation problems. So you might find that you've got vital information, vital records that's being stored on removable or unmanaged media. So you know, it's brilliant being able to copy files to a thumb drive really quickly and have that sort of secondary storage, but some thumb drives are small enough to get lost without really a trace. We sometimes have a lack of the metadata that it takes to interpret the data. So we still have the file, we still have the spreadsheets, but we don't necessarily know what all of those columns mean. So can we interpret the data once once we're able to find it? And that sort of brings me to the other point of being able to find that information. So if it's not properly organized, if it's not properly laid out, then are you going to be able to actually find the information that you need to provide? And at this point, you might be thinking, well, can't we just print everything, we know how to deal with paper records, we know how to preserve those, we know how to provide access to those. And that is obviously losing a lot of the key advantages of digital, um, digital formats. So digital formats allow you to search very quickly over their contents to be able to locate records, locate the individual files that you're looking for. It's very easy to create exact replicas, so copies that are completely exactly the same as the original are very easy to do in the digital world and very difficult to do in the analog world. So there's variable content, there's behavior of digital records, so things like databases, being able to track the changes of um, Microsoft Word documents, even the fact that those documents can be edited. Um, all of that is something that you would lose as soon as you start committing things to paper. And obviously there are a number of digital formats, a number of digital records that just can't really be printed. So CAD models, video, audio, ge geospatial data, how do you print those? How do you create a form that you're used to being able to deal with? So hopefully you're convinced that you need to keep your digital information and that you need to preserve it going forward. So the other challenge that we're going to face is that this information is not just fragile, it's actually potentially very complex as well. So if we think of something, canonical example of digital information, a web page. Now the web page that you see in your browser is actually there are, well, there are two structures um, that we can think in terms of. So there's the sort of what I call physical. It's not really physical. It's the, the individual files. So that might be a series of HTML files, a series of images. Um, you'll have a CSS file that controls the layout. You might be linking to uh, PDFs, to documents. And this is the web page as it's understood by a machine. So it's a series of files that have some kind of relationship to each other. And we might need to migrate any of these files at some point in the future if we need to change from one file format to another. But there's also a conceptual structure. So this is how we as humans understand this digital content. So we have a web page which has a layout, it has images in certain places, it has text in certain places, it has links to other web pages. Um, these might embed other images, links to, to documents to download. And this is really technology independent. So that web page is the same web page whether we look at it on a mobile phone or whether we look at it on a computer. And that's 
really where the information is because that's how we as humans understand it and interact with it and so that's what we're really aiming to preserve and we need to make sure that even though we migrate the underlying files so that the computer can still understand what's going on we also need to make sure that that conceptual structure is preserved as well and so there are a couple of main preservation strategies so if we go back to the this idea of the digital stack we can think of the migration strategy which is a way of managing file formats basically making sure that we always have a copy of that information in a format that is understandable by today's technology but we can also ensure that this information is still available by being able to replicate the the technology of the time of creation so we think of this as um, emulation so being able to use special software that recreates um, an original operating system um, the original software that was used to create that file so in that strategy we we're less concerned about managing file format migrations because we can um, effectively recreate the environment in which it was originally uh, created and meant to be interacted with. I mean, we're going to come back to these preservation strategies um, in next week's session, um, but needless to say, file format migration is the one that we are better at at the moment so it's the one that we will focus on um, mostly within this um, within this webinar so in case all of this still hasn't entirely convinced you that we need digital preservation I want to give you a couple of examples of the, the lack of a preservation strategy and so the first case study that I want to talk about is um, a series of images that were made on an Amiga computer by Andy Warhol so at the launch of the Amiga 1000 computer back in 1985 Commodore commissioned Andy Warhol to create some digital art on this new system to, to showcase its power as being a multimedia computer and they sent him a uh, an Amiga to play with to to do this and so he created some works beforehand to sort of learn the system and then at the launch event in New York he actually on stage live um, produced some um, some digital art so he took a, a digital photograph of Debbie Harry live on stage and then manipulated that as part of the presentation so the images he created at this time were stored to floppy disk and were bequeathed as part of his estate to the Andy Warhol Museum and in 2011 um, Carnegie Mellon's computer club were effect basically just searching through the, the museum's collections and they discovered these discs and the, the discs were still in pretty good condition they were still able to read all of the data back from those discs but it turned out they couldn't actually open the files they didn't know what was in that data and this was because when Andy Warhol had created them he was using a, a pre-release version of the of the hardware and the software and between that version and the actual formal release some of the specifications of the hardware and some of the specifications of the software had changed which meant that the, the format the images were in was never actually released to the public and they were completely unreadable so there was a, a three-year project that eventually was able to reverse engineer the, the file format turning up 18 new images um, so never before seen artwork from Andy Warhol so the lesson here I think is, is pretty clear information can be lost unless efforts are taken to preserve it and if they're taken early I mean we were able to reverse engineer we were able to extract that information that had effectively been lost but that's because 
people thought that it was definitely worth their investment. So it was a, a three-year project from some of the brightest computer scientists in the country. Um, will that always be the case with potential users of your data? Will they always have the, the technical skills and, and the resources available to undertake such a project to recover that information? And so the second case study is what really led to um, the coalescence of digital preservation of a digital preservation community. Um, so back in the mid 70s, NASA had sent um, the Viking lander mission to, to Mars to collect data from the Mar Martian surface. And these data sets were obviously going to be of use um, to future scientists as well as the a particular mission scientists, so they made sure that they were all compiled and stored to magnetic tape for long-term reuse. And the tapes were put in nice climate-controlled data centers and taken care of uh, physically. So in the in the 1990s, people came to, um, to come and sort of reuse that data to to try and um, actually read it back from the tapes and what they discovered was over that time the tapes despite the best efforts to conserve them had still become brittle and, and cracked and um, so with great care they were again able to read that data back from the tapes but again they discovered that the data sets couldn't really be retrieved because nobody knew how to decode the formats that it had been saved in so the original scientists the original people working on these missions had had long since um, moved on. Um, eventually, the original printouts of all of these of all of this data were tracked down, and everything had to be manually retyped, um, duplicating the effort from back in the 70s. And the whole compilation of the data set had to be repeated from scratch. Um, as a result of this, the, the space community realized that this was not a viable long-term plan to be able to, to duplicate all of this work. So they sort of formed a community to assess digital archiving and to figure out what a digital archiving system would need beyond just the, well, let's write to tape and hope for the best. And they developed a model that would eventually become the OAIS model, the Open Archival Information Systems model, um, which is now the sort of standard reference model for um, long-term digital preservation. And they came up with a model that really only a um, only a space scientist would think was a reasonable way of thinking about uh, digital information and the system that you would need to run it. So this in of all its gory detail is the OAIS model and um, before everybody sort of runs off the uh, off the webinar scared this is the last time that you have to see this diagram or, or worry about it in in any of its depth so that's sort of laid out the problem of why we need digital preservation so I'd like to take some time now to start looking at the, the solution of, di of you know, solving this digital preservation problem. And if we break it down to its sort of basic requirements, um, that nice OAIS model can basically be replaced with this nice simple diagram. So we need a, a repository that is capable of long-term preservation. So that means that we have some producer who is creating content and submitting it to the repository where it will be stored um, for the long term. And then at some point in the future, it may be today, it may be 100 years from now, there will be some consumer who comes along and makes a request to see some of that, um, some of that information, some of that content. And what we're going to send back to them is content in a usable form and I think that word usable there is the sort of the key word on this entire slide 
for it to be truly a long-term digital preservation repository, that always needs to be true. What people get back always needs to be usable to them as a consumer. And so the, just before we sort of delve into how this maps to some of the OAIS model, um, I just want to take just a moment to consider what kind of contents we're typically talking about here. So I've talked very much about abstract um, concepts of information and content. Typically, we think in terms of two main types of content. So we have digitized material, which is historic materials that maybe we've um, used high resolution scanners to take um, detailed images of, or potentially we have you know, typed the text from existing uh, historic materials into a digital format. And it's quite often possible to sort of recreate this content if we lose it. It's not always possible. We are sometimes taking the step of digitizing because we're worried about the, the physical state of that, um, of that record. Um, but even if we are able to reproduce it, it's, it's often a very expensive undertaking to, to go through. But perhaps of more risk is material that is born digital. So this is increasingly what institutions are having to deal with. So many key records have only ever existed in digital form. Um, minutes of meetings are typed as Microsoft Word documents and emailed around to people, uh, potentially as PDFs. It's not clear that they're ever printed, they're ever committed to paper. Um, and so the digital file is the record. Um, email, websites, uh, material from records management systems and databases, um, even organizations own internal intranets. These are all sources of born digital material and there is no physical master, so it's often impossible to reproduce these, um, these materials if they're, if they're lost or damaged in any way. But it's not just the, um, it's not just that digital content, it's also the metadata that uh, describes that content that we need to worry about. And so information in the OAIS sense of the word is that sort of complete package of content and metadata that is required. So putting some OAIS terms into our previous diagram, we can see um, this idea that a content producer is submitting a SIP and there's something called an AIP or an APE being stored in our OAIS repository. And to satisfy the the request of that consumer, we're getting a DIP or a DIP. And so these information packages um, are really the sort of currency of a digital preservation system. They're the, the sort of fundamental objects that we need to be thinking about um, in terms of transporting and, and storing. And so just to put some, some flesh on those acronyms, um, SIP or SIP is a submission information package. So that's the set of information, the, the content and the metadata that is supplied to the repository by a, a content producer. And when we start storing that, that becomes an archival information package. So that's the information, again, the content and the metadata that's stored within the repository. And when we start supplying that to somebody, it becomes a dissemination information package. And these might all be the same thing. So you might have a single SIP that is being supplied to you that gets stored as a single AIP um, and will always get sent out to anyone who needs it as a single DIP. But they're not necessarily always the same thing. So a content producer might create um, a single package that contains a number of records all sort of packaged up into, into one. 
um, that might get stored as several different AIPs because they are different records, they belong in different series or different collections within the repository. So they're stored as multiple AIPs. And then when you come to satisfy a request, it might be that providing just one AIP is enough, but it might be that the request can only be satisfied by a combination of multiple AIPs or even just parts of an AIP. And so that dip, that dissemination package that you're creating is not necessarily that single AIP. It's, it's some combination or part of um, what's actually stored within the repository. And so this also gives us a sort of background into some of the roles, some of the actors within an OAIS system. So the three sort of principal um, actors, the three principal roles that we need to be considering is the, the content producer, so the people who are generating information and submitting it for long-term preservation. We have the content consumers, uh, what OAIS terms the designated community. So that is the, the people who ultimately want to be able to use and interact with the information. Um, and finally, one that hasn't really appeared on any of the diagrams so far is the content managers. So that's, that's you guys, that's the archivists, the collection managers, the preservation managers. And there might be overlap between some of these roles, but there's also a, um, a responsibility for interaction between these roles, and that sort of falls onto the content manager. So the content manager is the person who is going to set policies for the system. It's the person who is going to ultimately determine or decide who the designated community is, what, they, what they're represented by. Um, and so how the information needs to be presented to be usable and understandable by that set of people. And that might mean that um, you have multiple designated communities using the same repository and they have different um, levels of perhaps technol technological sophistication um, or understanding of the, the core data that they're going to be given. And so the information that you hold, the metadata that you hold, needs to be able to cope with providing usable content to multiple sets of designated communities. And so there's also going to be a responsibility on the content manager to communicate with the content producer to make sure that actually what they're being sent is has enough um, metadata, there's enough information to make sure that that digital content is going to be um, usable, it's going to be understandable by those designated communities at a, at a future point in time. And so what this looks like as a, a sort of functional model is um, a repository that has a number of different functional requirements. So there are a number of different um, functionalities that need to be supplied by any digital preservation system. So you need some ingest functionality, so some way of negotiating with your content producer for um, accepting the transfer of information, the transfer of records. Once you have those records, you need some long-term archival storage um, functionality. So you need to be able to write that information somewhere that it's going to be safe for the long term. You need some data management functionality around that as well. So being able to ensure that you have the right metadata, that that metadata is kept up to date, that records are organized in, in the correct way and that again might change uh, over time. So you need some kind of functionality that allows you to do that. And you'll need some access functionality uh, that allows you to actually provide that information to a consumer at, at some point in the future. But on top of all that, you'll need some 
sort of administration functionality. So you'll need some some way of keeping this repository operating from day to day, somewhere of uh, making and recording your institutional policies regarding ingest and preservation and access. Somewhere to ensure that you can record and update and maintain your uh, retention and disposition policies. But what really sets a, a digital preservation system apart from just a, a content management system or a records management system is this concept of long-term preservation planning. So making sure that not only is that information organized and usable and findable today, that but that you're going to have the strategies in place to ensure that it remains usable and findable in 10 years time, in 50 years time, potentially in a thousand years time. And so this is a sort of a really standard diagram that you'll probably see a lot of in uh, digital preservation uh, presentations and talks. And it's important to sort of understand that this is the OAIS model that sort of tells you what you need in a digital preservation system. As a reference model, as an ISO standard, it doesn't actually tell you how to um, implement one of these uh, systems. So how do I implement an ingest functionality? How do I implement my preservation planning? Basically, how do I know that the system I have complies with that sort of OAIS model? And so you can go away and you can read the the ISO standard 14721. Um, it's very long, very detailed and technical. You don't have to read it. Obviously, lots of people have read it before you and have started building systems that conform to to that reference model. But we need some way of sort of assessing claims that we have a a uh, OAIS conformant um, repository. And so that's what the, the Trusted Digital Repository um, aims to, to provide. So that's, again, that's another ISO standard 16363. And it sets out the requirements of um, the OAIS model as a, a detailed checklist of metrics, things that you can actually um, review and measure and decide whether a given system meets that requirement or not. And so an example might be the repository shall assign and maintain a persistent identifier of the AIP and its components uh, so as to be unique within the context of the repository. The OAIS model sort of Im implicates that that requirement um, needs to be fulfilled. The, the Trusted Digital Repository uh, ISO standard really makes plain that that's something that needs to be um, implemented. Um, and finally, we have the Trustworthy Repositories Audit and Certification ISO model, uh, ISO standard, which is 16919. And that's the process of auditing the repository for compliance to TDR, so making sure that somebody who is um, auditing you against the 16363 actually knows what constitutes compliance with those metrics. So how do we audit the auditors effectively? But this isn't just a, um, a technology issue. This isn't just a question of if I build this system or if I buy this particular software, then I've got a an OAIS compliant system. A truly trusted digital repository is a combination of things. It, it's the people that you have involved, so the content managers, the collection managers. It's the policies and processes that you put into place, so making sure that you know what is acceptable for ingest in your particular repository, what your long-term preservation plans are. It's obviously the content that you have, um, and some part of it is obviously the, the system software, but to get a truly trusted repository, you need all of these places 
all of these um, parts in place. And so I don't know, I haven't been watching, but uh, Michael or Sarah, if you want to address any questions that anyone has come up with um, at this point, sort of the end of the detailed technical theoretical background. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, do we have any questions at this stage? We can take a <coughs> take a short a short break and get some get some questions before we move on to some of the more detailed uh, topics, uh, looking at fixity and uh, characterization, etc. As Rebecca saying there, you can ask your questions in the chat box. Okay, so there's a question about the sort of one-to-one -one mapping bullet point in the uh, SIP, AIP, and DIP slide. Um, so what I'm trying to convey with that is that we have this concept called the information package, which is the set of content and the metadata that's required to describe that content and make it understandable and usable. And we'll talk about this as a SIP when it's content that's being sent from a content producer to the repository. We'll talk about it being an AIP or an APE whilst it's actually in the repository. And we'll talk about it being a DIP when it's being sent back to a consumer. And so the, the, the sort of trap to fall into is thinking that a SIP has to be the same as an APE or it has to be the same as a DIP. And while that may be true, you might have a single record that is a single SIP that is stored as a single AIP and is transferred as a single DIP it's not necessarily true that those things are going to be the same set of content and the same metadata. So, as I say, you can have content producers who bundle several records into one submission because it's easier to send one submission than, than 10. But those might get split out by the repository to ensure that they are actually multiple AIPs within the system, so they're held as separate, independent, um, atomic packages of content and metadata. And then the DIP is really what you send to um, to satisfy a request. So uh, again, it might just be that one of those AIPs is enough to, to cover that entire request, um, but you might need two or three different AIPs from different collections, from different series in the system to really um, truly satisfy that request. So it's, although we talk about them all being an information package, it's not necessarily the same set of content and metadata in, at each stage. Okay, thank you, Jack. Any more questions at this stage? Okay, don't think there's any more any more questions. <coughs> Hopefully you are all still enjoying yourselves. So you want to move on, uh, Jack, to look at uh, some of the more detailed uh, subjects. Indeed. So what we're going to look at now is trying to understand what metadata we need for a digital preservation system. Um, we're going to talk about fixity, um, which you may have heard of, um, but not necessarily understand what, what we mean when we say fixity. And we'll talk about file characterization. So these are all sort of related um, topics. So the first kind of metadata that I'm going to start talking about and thinking about is the idea of structural metadata. So information, particularly in an archival setting, is often structured so to make it 
easy to um, to find to make sure that it's properly organised. Um, and the different um, contributors, different people might think in in terms of different um, ways of structuring their material. Uh, so you might have people who think in terms of um, series and sub-series and um, individual items within that. And you might have other people who think in terms of uh, collections and items. And so there's, um, there's a standard for structural metadata called ISAD-G. Um, so it's a general international standard archival description schema. And that defines a list of elements um, and rules that are necessary for the description of the structure of an archive. So they describe the kind of information that must be included in descriptions and bits of information which should be included. Um, for example, they have 26 different data elements that you could include or should include in, in your description. Um, but only six of those are actually mandatory, so reference codes are mandatory, titles, uh, the name and date of creation. Um, and the level of description, so whether you're describing um, an entire collection, whether you're describing an individual file, um, a particular item. So if we think about items, um, at a sort of abstract level, it's it's not entirely clear what constitutes an item. Um, and again, this is going to be something that is institution dependent, so and potentially um, content dependent. So an individual item might be an individual digital file. So the meetings of a particular uh, uh, the minutes of a particular meeting. But your item might need to encompass more than that. So we talked about um, records potentially being um, complex and compound and needing multiple uh, different files to represent a single information object like a web page or um, emails might be another good example where you have the message of the email and some attachment. And so both of the, the the message and the attachment might both be part of a single email item. And those items will typically live within something like a series or a collection. And so we might think of um, deliverable units, individual um, record level descriptions as being a, a, a particular series, so a, a, a series of um, minutes of the meeting of a single committee might be um, considered to be a single record that is a series or it might be um, a particular collection. And all of this sort of descriptive structure exists independently of the idea of the OAIS um, APE, the information package. So I'm going to show you what um, record structure might actually look like in a, in, a, in a digital preservation repository. So at this point, I need to switch my screen. Um, so hopefully now you're all seeing um, a login screen to uh, Preservica. So this is an instance of Preservica that's running sort of live on the on the cloud. And this is what our collection structure and our record structure looks like within the system. So each of these blue filing cabinet objects is a um, a collection. It's a high level represent. Uh, aggregation of material. So collections might be um, representative of things like individual 
departments or collection areas within the institution. And they might be structured, so you might have um, child collections within a particular collection. So I've got an example of the, the tree open down here on the left, where I've got um, a collection that I created for the iPress conference last week. Um, so this is holding information about the um, iPress showcase. And I've got further child collections for each of the years that um, this is relevant for. So I'm building up a, a sort of record structure, a descriptive structure. And then within each of those, I've got these, um, these folder icons, each of which is a um, what we call in Preservica, it's a deliverable unit, but you would probably think of it as being um, a record. And at this sort of top level entry, the, the folder icon, the record, represents um, an archival information package from the OAIS uh, reference model. But within that, we have essentially um, further structure. So we've got here um, an email export from uh, Microsoft Outlook, and the top level archival information package is that whole um, mail folder. But within that, the, the information is further structured. So we have individual folders, um, individual folders for deleted emails, um, individual folders for the inbox folder, uh, down to the point where we have a, a single record, a single deliverable unit for each individual email. So we might think of this as being the sort of item level in the ISAFG um, terminology. This is our item level record in this structure. And this is a good example of where an item is not necessarily just an individual digital file. So in this particular case, we've got um, an email that had an attachment. So obviously, both of those files need to be kept in that original context to um, make clear what the actual email was. But we might have um, other examples where the individual item level object is actually a single digital file um, and there's no further context needed to explain it. So hopefully it's clear that this is my my digital content, this particular .eml file, it's a, a file that has a discrete size. It's something that we can actually save to a, a storage location. We can open it using um, some particular program. But I've also got this um, metadata surrounding this particular file. So this is the, the, the metadata that is needed as part of the information package. It's not enough to just know that I have that EML file. I also need to know things that describe what type of file it is, um, reference to it in the, um, in the system, so a unique identifier for that particular file within the repository. And that begins to um, raise the question of well, what is metadata? What what do we need for metadata within the context of a digital preservation system? And really, metadata breaks down into several different types. So we have descriptive metadata and structural metadata, which are context about that content, which is going to make it um, usable um, usually for a human being. So the structural metadata will make it, will hopefully make your information findable and organized. And that descriptive metadata will tell somebody, you know, what this file actually is, what it represents, potentially details of its, um, how it came to be created. 
we need some access rights metadata. So we need to know what we can make available um, and who we can make it available to. Um, so it's not always uh, true to say that everything within the repository is going to be available to everyone. Um, and it's also not true to think that once we decide how that information should be made available, that that's fixed for all time. So we think of things like um, copyrights um, and classification, like government classified material. These are things where the level of access that we can provide will change over time. So we need to record that metadata as well. We have technical metadata, which is really what enables the, the long-term preservation um, and enables us to perform sort of risk assessment on our content and validation of what we actually have. So that's things like the, the detailed properties of a particular file. So file lengths, um, created dates and modified dates. Details like how many pages are in this Word document, how many words. And we also have um, a type of metadata that's sort of peculiarly uh, digital preservation metadata called the preservation description information. And that will help us to prove the, the authenticity and the provenance of particular records. So this is things like the, the file fixity um, and audit trails. And so we can start to think of our information package in the OAIS model um, a little bit more concretely now. So we have a package that contains some descriptive metadata, some technical metadata about the, the set of files. Um, it contains some structural metadata to record how this content was originally laid out. Contains some access right metadata to, to let us know who can use this um, and some preservation descriptive information as well. So that descriptive metadata might be things like the author, the title, the date, um, scope and contents of what's in this information package. Structural metadata might record things like original um, file directory hierarchies, uh, any parent-child relationships um, within records. Access rights might record permissions, who has permission to, to actually see this content, whether there are any embargoes on any part of it, whether it's subject to copyright or other restrictions. So as I say, technical metadata is things like how big is this file? How big are the, um, if it's an image file, what are the dimensions of the image? If it's a Word document, what's the, the number of pages or the number of words within that uh, document? And then the preservation descriptive information is things like the fixity, the, the reference the unique identifier for that particular file. So in terms of descriptive metadata, this is typically, as I say, created for and by humans. Um, and there's no single standard way of including descriptive metadata or even determining how much descriptive metadata you need. Um, and there are lots of different standards that you can choose to, to use within your institution. Um, so things like ISAT-G contains descriptive metadata. Um, you might use EAD, the encoded archival description. Standards like Dublin Core, which provide um, a list of elements that are all descriptive metadata elements. METS and MODS um, have some descriptive elements within them. Um, and things like Mark, which are widely used in the um, in the libraries world. So 
So a good preservation system should allow you to choose the descriptive metadata that best suits your own institutional needs and not sort of prescribe you into using a particular standard. So there's, a, there's another type of um, metadata that we talk about in the OAIS reference model, uh, which is called representation information, which sort of lives outside of that information package. It's not necessarily information about the particular content that you have. It's information about the type of content that that is. So it's, it's a way of telling us how to convert that binary representation, that individual digital file, into something that's a bit more meaningful. And this falls into three categories. So there is structural uh, representation information. And that deals with things like data types that are represented by the, the basic binary um, file encoding. So it might start with very basic components such as what string of bytes on a computer makes up um, a character um, or what string of bytes represents a number. And then that might build into um, more complex types like how do you extract words or uh, an individual pixel from this particular file type. Um, and ultimately it will build into a description of the overall file format. So how is that information um, encoded? We have semantic metadata which provides meaning and context beyond just the sort of type of data and the type of file that we have. So things to do with um, natural language. So we know that we can construct, we can read the, the bytes of that particular file to mean um, words in a particular way, but what natural language are those words in? So are they, is this an English document or is this, um, you know, is this Chinese, Japanese, uh, complex character document? And things like whether there is specific jargon or terminology uh, within the data. So if you think of a word like depth, it might have different meanings in your metadata depending on what type of information you're dealing with. So within an image, depth might mean the, the color depth that you're recording. But to um, geospatial data, depth might mean something very different. It might mean the, uh, you know, the distance underwater, for example, when looking at GIS data around rivers and lakes. So all of that is information that you need to be able to make meaning out of the um, out of the, the digital files that you've been given. And then we have this um, other category which is very usefully described in OAIS as being representation information that is neither structural nor semantic. Um, so this is again this is information that you actually need to be able to make sense of the, the raw data that you've been given. So this might be details about what software created that particular file. So that might make a difference to how you attempt to open it or extract that information at a later point. It might deal with whether that data has been compressed or encrypted um, and if so, what algorithms were used because that's, again, it's going to be something that you would need to know to be able to actually extract some meaningful information out of that digital file. And so that's a fairly sort of high level abstract concept. So I'm going to show you what uh, representation information actually might look like in real life. Um, and so I'm going to show you the, the technical registry with 
uh, file format details um, within Preservica. So again, I'm going to find my digital preservation system. And so I'm going to go to the registry, which is under preservation. This is our technical registry, which contains lots of factual information and policy information that will help enable long-term uh, digital preservation. And so straight from the outset, we can see an example of representation information. So this is details of a particular file format, so something like um, 3D Studio shape files. So this is not information about any particular file that we might have. This is information about the sort of the family of different uh, of different files that fall under the same format. And so the kind of thing that we might know about this, we might have a description which tells us roughly what this type of file was. Um, if there are known file extensions um, associated with this particular format, whether we know of software that is capable of um, creating this particular type of file, um, potentially whether we know of software that can render or validate it. Um, so you can find an example that might be slightly more familiar to most people. If we have a look at the representation information regarding Microsoft Word documents. So we know that Word documents are a particular type of file format, but we also know that they came in different versions. So that format changed um, over time as the underlying Office software changed. Um, so this is the particular entry for um, documents that were created from the release of Word 97 um, up until 2003. So we know that that has a particular file type associated with it. So that gives us some reference information when trying to ascertain what particular content is. Um, we know that something that's dot .doc is um, quite possibly one of these Microsoft Word documents. We know that there's a particular mind type. So this is a way of telling other software how to interpret the information that's coming to it. In particular, browsers make use of this mind type by determ um, to determine what type of data is being fed to it and thus how to deal with it. So should it prompt you to download this uh, particular file or is it actually an image that it can just display in line for you? So we know that there are some internal signatures. Um, so things that all Microsoft Word documents have in common. So it's the series of bytes at the beginning of the file that identify this as being a Microsoft Word document. So this is how we're able to identify it. And we'll come back to, to identification as part of the characterization a bit later on. And again, a list of software that we, we know of that might have been able to create this type of file um, in the first place. So hopefully you can see from that that a quite abstract concept turns into something quite concrete um, and something that's not hopefully entirely unfamiliar to you um, in your knowledge of working with uh, digital information. So I want to move back to talking about another specific type of, um, of metadata. This is fixity. So I've mentioned fixity um, a couple of times already today. So this is a type of metadata that is specific to digital materials. So a lot of the metadata that we're talking about, so structural, descriptive metadata, even potentially things like technical metadata, 
are things that exist in the analog world as well, or at least have analogs in the analog world. So the dimensions of a box might be considered technical metadata about that box. Fixity is something that is entirely um, a digital premise. And it's a way to guarantee the invariance of the bits and bytes that make up a particular file. So we can think of it as um, a fingerprint. So as long as the file hasn't changed in any way, its fingerprint won't have changed. So it's a measure of the file that we can use um, to guarantee that that file hasn't changed. We can guarantee that our, there's nothing wrong with our storage mechanisms. And if challenged at some later point, we can measure the fixity and, and check that the file that we've given somebody is exactly the same as the file that we were given originally. So the way of thinking about fixity is thinking about the, the sort of bits and bytes that make up a file. Um, if you think of them at their very lowest level, it's a digital file is a series of zeros and ones that are stored on a computer somewhere. And so we can think of that as actually just a really large number that's expressed in, in binary. And so because it's a number, we can perform all sorts of mathematical calculations on that number. Um, and fixity is a calculation or a series of calculation that for a given input number always produces the same answer. Um, and if one of the bits of that file changes, so if one of those zeros anywhere in the file becomes a one, um, vice versa, then the um, the answer from this sort of mechanic mathematical calculation uh, changes in a very big way, and that's sort of by design with fixity. A very small change in the input creates a very large change in the output, and so what's sort of clever about this is that the answer you give is always exactly the same length. So it doesn't matter whether we've got a file that's one megabyte large or 100 gigabytes. The fixity or the, you might hear it sometimes referred to as the, the hash or the digest or the checksum of that file is always going to be the same number of characters irrespective of the file size. And this is something that came out of cryptography, but basically what's extra clever about all of, about this calculation is that if you've been given the answer, there's no way of working backwards to figure out what the, um, what the input was. So that means that if you're told the fixity, you don't necessarily know the exact um, file, which means that it's very hard to, to sort of fake um, a fixity by by being told what it should be and then being able to like generate a another file that sort of matches that. So popular algorithms, popular ways of measuring this digest or this fixity is using um, MD5 or uh, what's known as SHA. So SHA comes in a number of different flavors, so SHA1, SHA-256, SHA-12, you might hear of uh, various others. And basically these become increasingly secure as that number at the end of SHA gets bigger. So that's to say that it becomes increasingly unlikely that you have two files that have the same fixity. But even at sort of SHA-1 and MD5, the odds against two different files having the same fixity is uh, astronomically large. Um, in practice, you can ignore that that's even a possibility. The downside of making it more secure is that it begins to take longer and longer to calculate. So why would we bother 
calculating the fixed fee, what can we what can we do with that at some point in the future? So I want to sort of talk through an example of where fixity might be very useful to you. So on this I have two different versions of um, a file of a, a, a PDF of a, a standard contract. Um, and at this point I'm not sure which is the authentic contract and which one of them has been uh, doctored in some way. And so hopefully you're looking at this and you're probably not even recognizing that these are different documents. They look very much the same um, from this level. But actually, there's the only difference between these two documents is a single comma that I've inserted. And the chances are that we won't notice that looking at it at this level. Um, there's a reasonable chance that we wouldn't notice that sort of difference even if we um, took the time to, to fully read both of these. But if we zoom in on the image on the on the left, we can see that in the clause about um, contract terms, we've got a, a comma here between five year terms and the word unless. Um, and if we zoom in on the copy on the right, we'll see that that comma is missing. Um, and so this isn't an abstract case. Obviously, the, the contracts are not uh, real contracts, but this particular sentence is a, a real sentence taken um, directly from a, um, a case, that, uh, a lawsuit from Canada a few years ago. Um, and in that case, the, the judge ruled that the, the comma being part of that sentence meant that there was a, a one-year notice period on termination of a standard five-year contract and um, successive five-year terms. Uh, because that contract was there, the judge ruled that that one-year termination period um, actually applied to the initial five-year agreement as well as all of the renewals. And if that comma hadn't been there, then the one-year termination period would have been interpreted as only applying to the renewals and not to the initial um, contract. And so that, con that comma being there uh, mistakenly actually caused something like a million dollars worth of damages to um, the person trying to defend their contract and saying that it was uh, terminated unlawfully early. So the point of this is to sort of illustrate that minor alterations to something like a, a document like this that we as humans are pretty bad at detecting. So we'd, we'd be bad at scanning to see that there was that difference. We're probably not a huge amount better at actually noticing that difference when we're reading, even when we're reading it quite carefully. That can have a major impact on on the way that that document is interpreted. So if we were contesting some kind of uh, court case where we were providing a copy of this document with the comma and the, um, the other person was providing a copy without the comma, how can we tell which one we're looking at is the original authentic copy that's been unaltered in any way? So we can do that using the fixity. So we can check the fingerprints, the digital fingerprints of this document. Um, and what you'll see here on the left and on the right is the, the MD5 fixity calculation of each of those PDFs um, and the SHA-1 fixity calculation of each of them. So to the computer, to, to the fixity, these files actually look nothing alike. And this illustrates that as long as we have the original checksum that we, me that we measure at the beginning of the document's life or at the beginning of our um, custody of that document, then we can easily test the authenticity of any future copy um, and make sure that it is an exact copy that is unaltered in any way, shape or form.
so I want to move on and spend the, the sort of the last part of this webinar looking at characterization of digital files. So characterization is really all about the question what? So what do I have? What type of object do I have? What what else do I know about it? And you know, so what? So what can I do with this information? So digital information, most digital objects make some kind of claim as to what they are. Um, so this might be implicit in their title, something that's called my document is claiming to be a document. Um, it might be something in their file extension. So anything dot doc is making some kind of claim to be a word document and it might even be in their structural context so if you've got a digital file that's in a folder called my pictures then you might be led to the assumption that that digital file is a picture of some description but do we really believe um, these sort of implicit claims that are being made by these digital objects. So we can think of characterization as like a, a border control for our repository. So if we think of border control and what they do, they'll, they'll take your passport and they'll check it. So we can check things, we can check security features, we can check serial numbers of the passport against the database to confirm that that is what it claims to be, that it is a valid passport. So with digital files, we would think about checking typically the file headers looking for um, a sequence of bytes that confirms that it is a particular type of file. So somewhere in the file headers, it might say this is a TIFF document. Um, and that's what we would use to identify something as being a TIFF. And we can go a bit further than that. So we can identify different types of file with, with varying degrees of certainty. So we might believe that a document is um, a Microsoft Word document purely based on the, um, on the .doc extension. So that would give us a sort of a tentative identification of that particular file type. The, matching a particular magic sequence of bytes that identifies it as being a Word document might give us um, a further degree of certainty that that's what we're dealing with. But in some cases, um, file formats have a, a published standard. So PDFs have a published standard of what constitutes a PDF. Um, and there are tools that will validate a particular file against a, um, a known standard. So you can tell not only that this identified as being a PDF, but that it was actually confirmed as being valid against that well-published schema. So having established, identified what that um, particular file is, we can start to ask, well, what else do we know about that particular type of file? So to go back to the idea of the passport analogy, um, on the passport, we can start asking, well, what makes this particular person different from other people of the same type? So lots of people have US passports. What makes this person uh, different? And so it's things like, their name, their date of birth, their place of birth, um, and their gender. And these are not things that are necessarily unique to that person. There might be several people with the same name um, or with the same date of birth, but it's things that are inherently true about that person. And so when we think of a digital file, we can measure some inherent properties to of a particular instance. So if you think about a 
um, an image file, a, a TIFF or a JPEG, we can measure things like the, the height of that image and the width, um, the color depth, the way that the color information is encoded. If we think about word processing documents, um, things like the number of pages, the number of words, um, at a more sort of complex level, things like the distribution of letter frequencies might be something that we could uh, potentially measure. Um, and for things like audio and video, we're thinking of like how long is this particular video? Um, what codec did it use? And so this is the technical metadata that we discussed earlier. And characterization is where we start to extract that technical metadata and, and record it and make sure that we know about it for the, the long term. And this is a process that can exist not just at the individual file level. So we already saw the idea of um, a website as having multiple structures that we can interpret and understand. So we can measure the technical properties of each of the digital files on their own, but we can also start measuring properties about the, the website as a whole. So how many links are there? Where are they linking to? Um, what documents are being pointed to? What's the interim relationship between these various files? So we can think about characterization at a conceptual level um, above the file. But we can also think of characterization below the file level. So if we think of a typical digital video format, so AVI or um, MPEG, that's actually a, a wrapper format, very much like um, ZIP, and it contains two different independent streams. So there's the video stream, which is the series of images that get displayed to your monitor. And then there's the audio stream, which is what actually plays the sound. Um, and quite often we could potentially extract the audio as a separate file, maybe in MP3 or WAV format. And similarly with the um, images, there's a particular codec that's recording the way that that uh, spatial data is, is mapped. So we can perform characterization about digital objects below the, the sort of object file level that we, we usually think of. So we can measure properties of the audio stream separately from properties of the video stream. So that's all very well and good, but why why would we do that? So we have to sort of separate the idea of data and information. So data is the the carrier of information. That's the, the file, the series of bits and bytes that get written to disk. And information is how we or how a machine interprets that data. And information is, is really the key. That's the thing that we're trying to preserve. It's the information that we want to make available to people in the future. And so to make digital preservation feasible, given the, the volumes of digital data that exist, we really need bulk processing and bulk management of this, of this data. And that means that we need to find some way of making our machine understand the information in the same way that we understand that information. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a deep technological problem, but for the non-ideal world that we currently live in, what we can at least start to do is work with um, the idea of proxies for information. So those intrinsic characteristics that we've been measuring, they're sort of proxies for the information so that we can determine that even if the uh, data changes from one file format to another, if those internal characteristics of that are the same in both formats, then that gives us some confidence that 
the transformation has been successful and that we've maintained that information. So you can think of technical metadata as being the, the characteristics that will allow you to validate your preservation strategies um, as you actually enact them in the long term. And so that's quite a, a lot of information to, to have to worry about being able to extract and measure. Um, I need to think about measuring my fixity and when do I do that? How often should I be checking that? How do I extract all of this technical metadata from all of these digital files that I have? And the good news is that these are all the um, bits of digital preservation that actually computers are, are pretty good at and we can write software that does this in an automated way. And so I'm going to show you how this part of the process is dealt with um, in Preservica. So I'm going to look at an ingest from the very beginning. So imagining that I'm a content producer, I have some content on my computer that I need to submit to my repository. And so I have a, a tool here called SIP Creator, which is going to generate um, an OAIS SIP from just the content that I have on my laptop. So I need to be able to point my uh, my tool at the actual content that it that I want to preserve. So if I find um, the set of data that I want to look at, so what I'm going to be um, ingesting is some some TIFF images from um, these are actually from the Library of Congress, um, and it's a series of digitised high resolution TIFF images um, relating to Amelia Earhart. So if I just find you the files. So I've got a series of TIFF files that I'm going to be ingesting. So I'm going to create a new collection to ingest these into. Um, and there are various other settings that I can play with that change some of the sort of descriptive metadata around this package, but for the time being, I just want to um, create this package. And this is the point at which I'm going to first measure the fixity of these files. So that's what the processing, or at least part of what that processing was doing. So I can go down and I can see the, the series of files that I'm going to send up. Um, and I've got some descriptive metadata about those files, so I know what, um, how big that file was when it was last modified. And you can see here that I've calculated the, the SHA-1 fixity for this particular file. So from this point onwards, any change that happens to that TIFF file, I can detect and I can measure. Um, so I'm going to export this uh, to a location on my computer that's being um, monitored by Preservica. So it's a sort of hot folder that will automatically start the process of um, uploading this content. And so once that has um, once that started, it will start uploading to um, the same cloud instance of Preservica that I've been showing you earlier on.
And then this is going to get picked up by Preservica and we're going to start uh, a full ingest process. And hopefully this will start automatically um, in just a moment. And so we can see what gets um, performed as part of that ingest process. So we're bringing the content into Preservica onto the application, starting to take custody of this. So we need to check that there were no viruses uploaded as part of that um, package. And at this point, I'm also going to perform a fixity check. So I'm just going to make sure that those files weren't changed in any way as part of the um, upload process. So there were no corruptions, no bits were dropped as part of that upload. The files that Preservica is now working on are the exact same set of files that I had on my laptop. Um, and we'll see that uh, characterization has also been performed automatically. Um, and we can see the kind of messages that come out of characterization. And this will give us an idea of the, the kind of characterization that's being performed. So um, we could see that we went through some sort of identification process, um, which was followed by um, validation of these files. So we've got a number of um, errors that occurred as part of the validation. So what we're saying is that these um, TIFFs have been, we've validated them against a, um, a formal standard uh, definition of what it means to be a TIFF file. Um, and there were a couple of things that were perhaps not quite um, aligned with the TIFF standard. Um, but these have only raised warnings because we want to we want to know that information, but we don't necessarily want to um, stop the ingest process because of that. Um, it seems like it's failing at a second step. So if I go back in to Explorer, we can see the outcome that would have happened had that ingest gone through um, cleanly. So we've got here um, a similar collection. So again, from the Library of Congress collection. Um, so we've got a series of TIFF images, um, this time to do with the, the Wright brothers and first attempts at um, manned flight. And so if we have a look at the properties of one of these individual files, we'll see that this is the same sort of basic metadata that we were creating as part of that original information package. So things like the file size, the file name, the file location. But we also have um, a series of uh, pieces of technical metadata. And this is what was measured as part of the characterization process. And so we can see that we've identified it as a particular type of file. So in this case, this is a TIFF file. Um, and if we want to see what that means, we've got a link to go and be able to see that representation information that we hold about TIFFs. So we can understand a bit more about what type of file we have. But we've also measured some of the inherent characteristics, the inherent properties of this particular um, example of a TIFF file. So we know that it's uncompressed data. We know how big the image is. We know that it's a, a black and white image and that in this case, black is represented by zero. Um, we know the, the sampling frequency of this particular image. So something about the, the quality and the resolution. Um, and we know more abstract esoteric things, even like the, the byte order in which the, um, the series of zeros and ones was written. So this is, again, this is sort of abstract technical knowledge that is not particularly important at the moment, but in a hundred years time, if we're trying to 
write some software that will open this particular TIFF file, knowing what order the numbers were written in is going to be a very important piece of information. And finally, we can see that the, um, the fixity has been recorded. So this was measured at the point that that SIP was created, um, and it's been recorded so that we can guarantee the, the long-term storage integrity of this file um, going forward so we can tell whether anything has happened to this file um, at any point in its life. So we've looked um, at a lot of metadata and what it means to record the, the metadata that's required for long-term preservation um, and hopefully you can also see that this is the kind of um, actions, the kind of uh, things that can be performed by a digital preservation repository for you. So you don't have to, to worry about all of this yourself. You just have to worry about the sort of arrangement and description um, and the things that have traditionally gone with um, archiving and collection management. And so with that, I think we are just about out of time for the um, presentation. So we still have some time to take any further questions. OK, thank you, Jack. Um, so I think that so we've been looking at fixity metadata and some of the sort of fundamentals of, of OAIS. So any, any questions on any of those? Then, enter those in the chat box and I think the, the key thing is there's a, a lot of things to consider within digital preservation and a lot of information to capture to ensure that um, you know, we can continue to make files accessible into the future um, but as, as Jack was saying um, you know a, a good system will will automate a lot of that activity uh, for you and hide hide a lot of that uh, so you can go and a focus on you know the the, the structure and the, the curation of the, of the archive. So any any questions? We have some. Thank you a lot for the presentation. Uh, coming in, in in the chat from Sergi. Um, so there's a We have a question down in Q&A too. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question is whether Preserver can provide a standard set of file formats for new clients. Um, so Preserver can accept files that are in any format and we can start um, preserving at least at a bit level, so guaranteeing things like the storage integrity. Um, and then there are different sort of levels of support um, depending on how, how well known the file type is um, generally within the community. So you saw an example of um, files that are able to identify, so we're able to identify things like TIFF files and Microsoft Word documents. Um, there's then a sort of subset of those files that we're able to actually validate against a published schema. Um, so again, TIFF is one of those, PDF would be one of those. There's a whole series of files that we will be able to actually extract um, technical metadata about. So again, depending on the availability of tools that know about how to read these files. Um, and then we'll look at sort of file format migration in the next session, but um, there are, again, a, a, a set of different types of files that Preservica is able to actually migrate and uh, perform that kind of level of transformation with as well. Um, I'm not sure if these lists are sort of published anywhere, um, largely because they they change quite often. So um, we use the, the Pronom uh, signature database that's provided by the, the UK National Archives. Um, and so 
every few months we might learn about a new file type that we can identify um, as we get increasingly sophisticated tools we can add more files that we're able to perform some of the advanced uh, topic uh, support for as well um, so I'd have to check whether we got that published anywhere but okay thanks Jack uh, any more any more questions You're either bamboozled or you knew it all already. <laughs> okay, no more no more questions. So we should we move move forward if you move, move the slides, Jack, it's probably easiest. All right, so one final one the, the software oh, yeah. being used before ingesting into the cloud was um it's a tool called SIP Creator that is designed to work with Preservica. Um, it's very similar to the Library of Congress um, bagger tool. It creates packages of information um, from content on your on your uh, local computer. Yeah, and that's something we'll explore in in module two: the different ways that content can be ingested. You know, through human human interaction as well as you know directly from from systems as well. Okay. So thank you, thank you everybody for for dialing in today. I hope you found that a uh, a useful uh, session in terms of outlining some of the fundamentals of digital preservation, why we need digital preservation. Uh, and also, you know, some of the mechanisms behind proving the authenticity and the provenance and characterizing uh, information so it can be interpreted uh, in, in the future. As I said, Module 2 is coming up um, next Tuesday, same time, 2 till 4, where we'll begin to look at um, how digital preservation kind of fits within the information landscape and, as I said, how you can ingest uh, information from different systems uh, and, and through different methodologies and also share that uh, with different designated communities. Uh, we also have a webinar coming up on the 8th of December uh, where we'll uh, explore that kind of topic uh, as well. There's a few papers you might want to look at if you haven't seen them already up on the Preservica website and lots of information about uh, different resources, videos, um, as I said, white papers, case studies of, of other people using uh, digital preservation. So before you go, as Sarah was saying at the beginning, if you'd like a copy of the slides, then we'd also love to get your feedback. Uh, this was the objectives of today, uh, to look at some of the fundamentals from the main acronyms and theory and illustrate that with uh, practical examples. So really, you know, really value your feedback um, and your, your input so we can keep on uh, keep on improving uh, so when you when you sign up please complete the short evaluation It'd be much appreciated anything you want to add uh, Sarah oh there we go I just unmuted myself no thank you uh, everybody thank you so much for attending and we're looking forward to seeing you next week okay take care thanks everybody and uh, have a great uh, rest of rest of the day. Any questions that occur to you in the meantime, then uh, pop them through on info at .com. Thanks very much, both of you, Michael and Jack. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack.